Hi everyone, in chapter 2 we discuss uh, the court system at the federal level. We give a little bit of a uh, guide into how to read case studies you'll find in your book and online. We'll discuss uh, an overview of the at-will work environment. Uh, we'll talk about employment discrimination concepts at a high level. Um, so with that said, let's jump right in. So one thing to understand about the federal court system, again, talking about the federal system, every state has their own system as well. But a lot of this employment law is handled at the federal level. So let's talk about that first before we dive into state systems. Uh, the federal court system divides the country up into districts that you can see right here. Uh, so various geographic regions of the United States fall into different circuits. Each circuit has its own federal court system consisting of lower level um, district courts and then appellate courts. Um, so let's say I have a federal court case going on here in North Carolina. Uh, I would try it in the middle district here in North Carolina. Uh, if I'm not happy with that decision, I can appeal to an appellate court for the Fourth Circuit. If I'm still not happy, I can try to appeal again. Uh, and my final option, go into the United States Supreme Court. Uh, and that's how that would work. So the way the court system works, both at the federal and state level, is a concept called stereodecesis, which you can see here. That's how to pronounce that, stereodecesis. You'll find alternate pronunciations, but that seems to be the predominant one. Uh, what it means is, it's a translation from Latin that says, let the decision stand. So the idea is that once a court uh, in a certain circuit or a certain system decides one way on a set of circumstances, the rest of the courts in that system are supposed to follow that decision and decide the same way in subsequent uh, cases with similar circumstances. So, uh, that's the overview of the federal court system. That's what stereodecesis means. Uh, so then, let's move right into some case vocabulary. So when you're reading case studies in the book, uh, there will be a lot of unfamiliar language at first because you have to get used to what some of the words mean. So you're probably aware that a plaintiff is a person who brings uh, a civil action against somebody else. You're probably also aware that a defendant is the one against whom a suit is brought. You may or may not be aware that an appellant, let's say we have an original court uh, trial with a decision and somebody's not happy with it so they appeal it. The person who appeals the decision is going to be the appellant. They bring the appeal. The person uh, against whom the appeal is brought is the appellee. Uh, if we go all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, the person who appeals uh, to that level is called the petitioner. And then the person against whom the case is appealed to the Supreme Court is called then the respondent. When you're looking at cases in the book and online, you'll see case citations, which is a series of numbers, letters, words that indicate where you can actually find the full text of the case. The full text of the case can be uh, 20, 50, 100 pages long, just depending on how complicated it is. And so what you'll find in the back of your book is some pretty uh, short um, excerpts and summaries of cases. So let's say somebody appeals a case to an appellate court. The appellate court hears it. Uh, and sometimes you'll see that the appellate court affirms the decision. That means that they agree with the lower court's decision um, and so they let that decision stand. Sometimes, however, they disagree with the lower court's decision so they reverse it. So sometimes you see that the decision has been reversed and then the appellate court um, makes its own uh, decision. Sometimes uh, the appellate court needs to know more information or maybe there's just some reason to send the case back to a lower court uh, for further proceedings to decide damages sometimes is what happens um, and that's what's called remanding so if you see that uh, a case has been remanded it means the appellate court has decided some kind of way they've either re affirmed or reversed a um, lower court's decision and they send it back to the lower court for further proceedings in almost every case, uh, one of the first things that will happen when a case is brought 
uh, is that the person against whom the case is brought will file a motion to dismiss. And it's basically asking a judge to throw the case out. They don't think there's enough evidence um, for a violation of law. Um, and then the two sides can argue about whether or not that motion should be granted or denied. Uh, if the motion to, to dismiss is not successful, oftentimes uh, one party will file for a motion of summary judgment, which means that uh, that, decide, that side doesn't think there's really a need to go through an entire trial. They think the facts that are presented give enough information for the court to make a decision right then and there. And of course, that would significantly lower the amount of time and money that's involved. So that would be an ideal outcome for the person who's making the motion. So as we discussed earlier, appellate courts can affirm or reverse lower court decisions, sometimes remand it back to the lower court, and then sometimes that court gives instructions uh, on what to do. Those instructions could be to try a certain piece of evidence or to decide on money damages or just to keep in mind a certain concept uh, when they're making a decision. Every now and then you'll see that a court makes a per curiam decision. Um, especially at appellate court decisions, oftentimes, and especially at the Supreme Court, you can read very detailed, long decisions and there will be the justice that um, actually writes that decision will put his or her name on it and then other justices can join on um, either agreeing and then sometimes judges that disagree can write their own dissenting opinions. In a per curiam decision uh, the entire court renders a decision collectively but they don't put their name on it um, and these decisions tend to be pretty brief. So that's a short summary of some of the vocabulary you'll see. Another very important concept in employment law is the prima facie case. This is very important. Uh, prima facie is a Latin term that means at first glance the concept being that in order to bring a lawsuit I need to first convince the court that I actually uh, have the basic elements of a lawsuit there. Um, so I would have to establish my prima facie case. That would allow me to bring a cause of action. A cause of action means I have the legal right to sue when certain rights have been violated. Uh, establishing my prima facie case uh, means that I have met the requirements that constitute uh, me bringing a cause of action. So uh, what we'll learn later on for, let's say I'm bringing a discrimination case, I need to satisfy certain elements like um, convincing the court that I actually do belong to a protected class, convincing the court that I have actually suffered an adverse action, and for different types of lawsuits there's a different list of things that I have to satisfy in order to establish that uh, prima facie case. In the United States, the default setting for an employment relationship is what we call at-will. At-will employment means that at any given time, both parties are free to terminate the relationship at their own will, meaning whenever they want to. So that means in most cases, an employer can terminate an employee uh, for any reason they want to. They don't even have to legally provide a reason. And in most cases, an employee can leave an employer for any reason that they want to, uh, or without providing reason at all. You also are probably used to giving two weeks notice if you leave a position. Uh, while that is a common courtesy, it's not a legal requirement. So some people are excluded from at-will employment. Uh, some states are not at-will states, but in the United States most states are. North Carolina is included in that. But let's say you're in an at-will state. If you're a government worker, you might be excluded from at-will uh, because you might have your own rules within the government about uh, how that relationship works. If I belong to a union and we have a collective bargaining agreement with our employer, that contract is what's going to guide the relationship rather than at will. Uh, similarly, if I'm just an individual, individual and I have a contract with my employer, that contract guides the relationship rather than at will. For everybody else, uh, at will is the default setting uh, and that's the general rules that we follow. 
We just said that at will is the basic guidelines of how the relationship works, but there are some very important exceptions to that. Among those are unlawful discrimination under Title VII, the Americans with Disabilities Act, or any other employment discrimination laws. So I can't fire a woman just because I don't like hiring women. Uh, likewise, I can't fire a man just because I don't like men. That would be unlawful discrimination because they're covered. Gender is a protected class under Title VII. Also, we have a concept of public policy. Public policy just means um, we try to set policy that is good for the public at large. So it, if I am an employee and I'm informing about illegal activity that's going on, uh, if my employer asks me to do something that's illegal and I refuse, uh, if I'm performing jury duty, uh, or if I'm performing something that I have the statutory right to do, uh, that includes uh, voting, filing a workers' comp claim, testifying in court, then my employer is not supposed to be able to fire me for doing those things. Voting is an interesting one uh, because my employer can't fire me just because I vote. However, they're also not required in North Carolina to provide me any specific time to vote. I'm still supposed to do that on my own time. So let's say I do something uh, that is a protected activity and my employer fires me for it or somehow uh, punish me, punishes me. That's what we would call uh, retaliatory discharge. That's being fired for doing something that I had the legal right to do. In other words, they retaliated against me for exercising some right that I have to do. Uh, in this case, Burlington Northern versus White, the court expanded adverse actions to anything a reasonable employee would view as significant. So not just firing, not just demotion, uh, so it includes all adverse actions. Whistleblowing is an interesting concept. It means uh, employees who would, well we say blow the whistle, in other words, let some media organization or somebody else in government know uh, that something's going on that shouldn't be going on. And the question as to whether or not I have protection for whistleblowing depends heavily on the circumstances, where I'm located, who my employer is. So if you're considering being a whistleblower, uh, you want to talk to somebody who has some knowledge of law in that area to make sure you're going to be protected before doing that. Another exemption to the at-will uh, environment is constitutional protections. So uh, the freedom of speech uh, is one that we would consider here. The interesting part about this is that constitutional protections only uh, apply to public employees because my constitutional rights protect me from the government. They don't protect me from uh, other people. So if I'm working for a private employer, uh, my freedom of speech uh, is probably not going to be a very good argument um, if I get fired for something that I said. However, if I'm working for a government organization, uh, it's a lot easier to argue that they violated my freedom of speech and retaliated. The implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing uh, is this idea that in every contract there's an implied agreement that each party should deal with the other one fairly and neither should do anything that would destroy or injure the right of the other to receive the benefits of the contract. Now, in some states this is allowed as an exception to at will. Uh, in North Carolina it does not look right, uh, it does not look like that's going to be uh, an acceptable exception to at will. Likewise, in other states, there are some additional arguments like implied contract, implied promise, or promissory estoppel. Uh, and again, in North Carolina, it looks like those are not valid exceptions right now. The Worker Adjustment and Retrading Notification Act, otherwise known as WARN, uh, is this piece of legislation that guides when a company is going to be shutting down or laying off a lot of people at one time. So if the employer has at least 100 workers, uh, we need to give the workers at least 60 days notice that the company is going to be closing. If the plant closing is going to trigger um, 50 or more employees within 30 days, 
Uh, we also need to warn people. Um, if there are going to be losses of 500 or more workers in 30 days, or if 50 to 500 workers uh, would constitute one-third of the workforce, uh, we need to give notice. Uh, there are some exceptions to this. Um, the faltering company exception means that uh, the company just is not in a position to be able to give adequate warning because the economics just aren't working out. It's not going to be able to stay in business that long uh, if it has to give 60 days notice. If there's a natural disaster which can't be foreseen, uh, if there is some other sudden dramatic and unexpected business circumstance that we couldn't reasonably foresee, I might be able to get an exception to that. In North Carolina, you can follow this link to learn at, uh, about some other protections specific to our state. Constructive discharge is another exception to at will. And constructive discharge is an interesting concept because it means that an employer either can't or doesn't want to legally terminate an employee so rather than firing them and facing the possibility of a lawsuit, what I'm going to do is make their life miserable. I'm going to create bad conditions for them and just hope that they give up and leave on their own accord. Uh, that's still not lawful. It is an exception to at will. And that doesn't mean I get to avoid a lawsuit. Uh, they could come back and argue that what I did was called constructive discharge, which is unlawful. Sometimes there are other... Uh, tort liability circumstances that would create an exception to uh, at will. Um, if uh, discharging me acts to defame an employee, these are very specific circumstances that don't happen all that often. However, if this discharge is an effort by an employer to defame, harm the reputation of an employee, then that could be an exception to at will. Uh, or if the termination of an employee results from the wrongful invasion of privacy, that would be the final exception that we talk about. Let's move on to some em employment discrimination concepts. First among those is what we call disparate treatment. When talking about discrimination, disparate treatment is the easy one. It's overtly treating similarly, similarly situated employees differently because of some protected class that's covered under Title VII. Uh, so covered under Title VII is race, color, gender, religion, national origin, things like that. Um, disparate treatment doesn't happen that much. Uh, nowadays because savvy employers have learned the rules and if somebody's going to be discriminatory they oftentimes will find more sinister ways to go about it. However, let's say somebody has accused me of disparate treatment discrimination. I have a couple of defenses at my disposal. One of those is called the legitimate non-discriminatory reason defense. We'll oftentimes abbreviate that as LDNR. This can be anything that makes sense and is not related to prohibited criteria. So an example of this could be, let's say somebody accuses me of discrimination uh, because I fired them and they think it's because of racial discrimination. I could counter and say I have a legitimate non-discriminatory reason in that they were late to work 10 days in a row and they just weren't doing a very good job. So the reason I fired them wasn't because of their race, but because they weren't performing very well. That would be an LDNR. Another defense I have available to me is called the bona fide occupational qualification defense, or BFOQ. These are pretty rare, uh, but if I'm able to successfully argue for a BFOQ, it's because um, I have some, there's something about this job, something about this position, that is so particular to it that it allows me to discriminate where otherwise I would not be able to. It's not available for every protected class, but it is perhaps available for gender, religion, age, national origin. Uh, it's not available for race or color. An easy example of a BFOQ would be if I have a restaurant and I'm going to hire somebody to be a bathroom attendant. It's reasonable for me to want that bathroom attendant to be of the same gender of the bathroom they're going to be working in. So I wouldn't hire a man to be a female um, 
a, a bathroom attendant for a female bathroom I wouldn't hire a female to be a bathroom attendant for a male bathroom um, so that's what that means if disparate uh, treatment is the easy one to understand disparate impact is a little bit harder to understand uh, insofar as discrimination goes so what happens with disparate impact is that an employer has a policy and on its face that policy seems very neutral not discriminatory at all or at least that's the way it seems but upon examination we find out that it has a disparate impact on some protected group an example of that could be requiring all of my police officers to be over uh, six feet two inches tall while that doesn't seem discriminatory on its face the impact that it's going to have is that significantly fewer women will be qualified to even apply at that point so it could be considered to have a disparate impact on women and when the EEOC is looking at these cases to try to figure out if there's a disparate impact they follow what they call the four-fifths rule so disparate impact according to the four-fifths rule is statistically demonstrated when selection rate for a protected group is less than 80 percent of the sky of the higher scoring majority group that is an EEOC rule uh, courts aren't necessarily legally bound to that rule but it is something they can use to help guide them when trying to decide if there's a disparate impact there so let's say somebody accuses me of disparate impact discrimination I have a couple defenses available here too one of these is the business necessity defense and what that means is that uh, I have a policy in place and that policy might result in discrimination however it is necessary and it's job related so a couple of examples that we see uh, in modern context are things like credit checks and criminal history checks uh, when I'm applying for jobs we might find out that credit checks and, and criminal background checks uh, actually discriminate against some people groups making some people groups some protected classes less qualified for certain job positions but so far a lot of employers have been able to successfully argue that it's a business necessity if somebody's going to be handling money they should be able to pass a credit check if somebody's going to be working with the public or other people they should be able to pass a criminal history check another uh, defense I have to discrimination claims is a pretty simple one which is that the employees evidence is untrue if I can prove they just made up that evidence uh, then that's a pretty easy defense for some forms of discrimination and for some protected classes uh, I might as an employer need to make an accommodation for those people if they request it so if we look at title 7 uh, one of the protected classes for which I might need to make an accommodation would be religion so if I have a person who belongs to a particular religion who's requesting Sundays off I might have at least some duty to try to find other employees who might want to cover their shift uh, and at least try to accommodate that uh, if we're talking about the ADA disability is another one of those protected classes for which I might need to make an accommodation so building a wheelchair ramp or finding a way to make the workplace more accessible to somebody with a disability uh, is something I might need to do as an employer uh, we should also point out that that duty to accommodate uh, goes only up to the point where it imposes an undue hardship on the employer uh, what exactly constitutes an undue hardship kind of depends on how big the employer is how much resources they have uh, and how much it would hurt them to try to accommodate that employee when talking about discrimination we also have this idea of exhausting administrative remedies this uh, especially applies to if I'm trying to bring a federal case so what this means is that we have an administrative agency set up to handle employment discrimination claims that's the EEOC 
the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. So before I go to federal court and try to file a lawsuit, I first have to go the, to the EEOC and say, uh, here's what's going on. I'm facing discrimination based on uh, whatever uh, is going on in my life. And before I go to the court system, I have to let the EEOC try to handle that case first. They're going to approach my employer, tell them what's going on, and we're going to try to find a remedy, uh, maybe through mediation or maybe just some type of settlement agreement. Um, only after the EEOC has determined that uh, maybe there's no case there to be made, they can then give me uh, permission to go to the court system myself. A little bit different is if I try to file a case in state courts. So in North Carolina, we just had a whole big deal about the House Bill 2, um, the whole debacle about that that happened uh, last year, where uh, under HB 2, uh, the state tried to take away uh, people's ability to go straight to state court uh, to file discrimination claims for protected classes. Um, that that area of law is evolving. Um, my understanding is that they reversed that decision and, and now you do have access to state courts instead of having to go uh, to the EEOC. Um, but that's something we're going to be dealing with uh, probably for the foreseeable future. Talking about remedies. When we talk about a remedy, we're talking about um, something you're seeking. You're going to sue somebody, you're going to a court asking them and saying, I've suffered some type of loss, I've suffered some type of damages, um, and I would like somebody to pay for this or to do something to help make up for it. So there's different kind of remedies out there. One of them is back pay, meaning um, I got fired. If I hadn't have been fired, I would have been working for the past six months, and so I should get the wages that I would have earned. Uh, front pay is kind of the opposite, which is if I hadn't been fired, I would have been working for the next two years and I would have earned this amount of wages. Reinstatement means I got fired, I shouldn't have been fired, and what I really want is to be reinstated back to my job that I lost. That's a tricky one depending on the relationship you have with your employer. If I work in a place where seniority is a big deal, seniority might determine uh, what kind of raises I get, what type of work schedule I get. Um, so if I lost seniority because of some type of discrimination, I might be able to get retroactive seniority to have that um, put back in. Injunctive relief, uh, when we talk about an injunction, we're usually saying uh, that somebody should stop doing something. An injunction is basically a court order that somebody should stop doing something. So maybe uh, my boss is harassing me um, and I'm trying to get injunctive relief to make that person stop doing that. Attorney's fees are a very significant uh, type of remedy. Uh, if you haven't been to court before, what you'll find is that it can be an extraordinarily expensive thing to try to sue somebody because it costs a lot of money to pay the attorneys to help handle the case for me. And it's very difficult to go to court on my own without the help of an attorney. We also take uh, damages and break them up into a couple different categories. All the different types of remedies that we talked about thus far are all included under what we call compensatory damages. These are also called real damages or actual damages. It means the things that I can quantifiably prove um, and say that I need to be reimbursed for. So lost wages, future lost wages, um, emotional pain, mental anguish, uh, those are a little bit harder to quantify, but still considered to be compensatory damages. We differentiate compensatory with punitive damages. Punitive damages generally aren't what we're going for um, in an employment discrimination case. I'm usually limited to compensatory damages, but let's say a court uh, might decide that a company was acting deceitfully or willfully wrong, and they might need to be punished. So that's what punitive damages are. They're damages designed to punish a company, uh, to disincentivize them from acting that way in the future, and also to deter other companies from acting similarly. The last thing this chapter talks about are additional legal resources available to you. Um, 
you'll primarily be using our textbook and maybe some online search engines but if you get really serious about the law and want to do some research there are libraries set up where you can go look at um, court decisions you can even go to Gaston College's library and look up uh, a lot of court decisions there uh, on the internet there are a couple of very popular paid services LexisNexis and Westlaw that allow you to do very deep dives into court cases and find a lot of really good information but they are paid um, for this class purposes since we're not really in law school um, if I ask you to do research on a particular case you can probably just google it uh, and find all the information that you need